Hello and welcome to today's Business Skills webcast, The Change Intelligent Leader. My name is Sarah Gonzalez and I'm from Redback Conferencing. Now most of us know that around 70% of change projects fail to realise the intended business outcomes that we originally had in mind. On top of this, poor execution of any change management plan that we put in place can always leave our teams frustrated and disengaged. Today we're here with Hugh Thomas from Blue Seed Consulting. He's here to enlighten us all on how we can become the change intelligent leader and I'm excited for one because I feel like change management is something that everyone talks about but very few do right so welcome thanks Sarah great to, Good be, to here. be here um, so technology is moving fast we hear the word digitize digitization, sorry, i would get that one out, uh, can be quite tricky. And all of us know that we're living in the age of this entrepreneur. So how does this impact or intensify competition, especially when it does come to disrupting incumbents and also mm. impact change management for us? Yeah, well, there are lots and lots of different uh, forces for change within organisations. Mm. Uh, and I guess all of those forces are underpinned by technology and digitisation. Mm -hmm. Those things are really driving many different aspects of uh, the organisational landscape or the mm -hmm. industry landscape globally. Um, and some of those things you know, impacting competitors, so how organisations need to keep up or beat competitors or mm -hmm. be ready for the next competitor. They impact customers, um, so with customers' preferences and so forth. Uh, employees as well have a different experience um, and have different expectations of organisations. Mm -hmm. Um, and the government as well. Um, we're seeing changes in how governments are impacting organisations as well. So all of those four diff um, key things are impacting uh, how organisations manage their businesses and change their businesses. And all of those uh, aspects are really uh, impacted by digital and mm. technology. So uh, some of the examples of that are with competitors, it's really the age of the entrepreneur and the startup. You would. Uh, you would know this if you've been reading any sort of yeah. business publication these days. You know, Silicon Valley is really a hub for entrepreneurs, and some of the world's largest organisations aren't very that, aren't very old. They're less than ten years old, mm. uh, and it's easier than ever to start a business um, and to disrupt an incumbent large organisation. Mm. So, uh, it's also. Um, Customers are becoming faster and more agile in the way that they go to market. So mm. uh, if you're a large organisation, chances are your, your competitor down the road is trying to get faster, get the new product out quicker mm. than you, put in new technology which is going to free up their people's time, uh, things like that. So all organisations are facing that pressure to be faster and to keep up with those new entrants into the market. Um, customers as well have very different expectations to what they did five or ten years ago. Mm. They expect things to be uh, cheap or free and fast and easy, more, mm. more so than ever. Uh, and they have a very low tolerance for otherwise. When they get bad service, uh, you know, it's easy to get on social mm. media and, and rant about it and you're impacting potentially hundreds or thousands of people when you do that. It's also easy to switch uh, providers. So people can open a bank account in a couple of minutes mm. um, and switch all their banking over to that. Reasonably easy, um, much easier than they used to be able to. So changing customer prefer preferences mean organisations need to continually change the way that they serve customers and have better standards. Mm. Um, employees as well are experiencing really a, a greater value of purpose in their work. Uh, they know they can switch jobs mm. quite easily. Uh, they've got more competitors coming in who are trying to attract that talent with, you know, whether it's providing a ping pong table or mm. places to sleep during the day, yeah. you know, the value proposition is competitive as well for customers. So the older organisations need to really reinvent themselves and become that cool, funky place to work. And that um, whole culture, and we spoke about this two weeks ago, funnily enough, the whole mm. culture aspect can actually play into brand for many organisations. So it's almost Absolutely. like these three prongs or well, you've got it right there, they all go yes. into organisational change, don't they? Whereas 10 yeah. years ago, we might not have thought that. That's right. Yeah. And all of them interact with each other, as you said. Mm. So customers like, are also attracted to businesses which mm. have that great culture because if they get, they see that in the branding, they see that in the frontline employees who are really happy in their jobs. So mm. customers will be attracted to them as well. Um, and as well, the government, as you see, you know, a lot of people are dissatisfied with the government, whether mm. that's because, you know, politicians are doing a worse job or we just have more information and we, can, we know about all the problems yeah. more so and people have a greater voice on social media mm. so you hear more about the issues and, and the problems with government. Whatever the case, there's also uh, a faster turnover of leaders so there's mm. more uncertainty. Certainly in the last um, you know, 10 years or so, we've had many different leaders of the country, different leaders of major parties. 
um, and different balances of power in the, in the houses as well with the Senate, you know, smaller independents and so forth mm -hmm. having a lot of say, they can hold up policy and hold up legislation. And that just creates a bit of unpredictability, mm -hmm. you know, things like changes to super impact a lot of investment and fund managers. Um, the recent bank levy that was introduced, um, banks didn't see that coming, they're going to have to adapt to that and either work out how it affects mm. their customers, their shareholders or employees. Uh, so there's a lot of volatility. So the key term which underpins all this that we refer to and is often referred to as VUCA, which is V-U-C-A, a volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous environment. It sounds really like end of the world <laughs> when a bit you say scary. it like that. It can yeah. be a bit scary, but what we believe, I mean, at Blue Sea, what yep. we believe is we accept that yep. and we just work out, well, what do we as individuals need to do mm. to cope with that, to not yep. freak out, to not stress and accept that it is really uncertain and mm. just adapt to that. So you've obviously ch seen a lot of changes and we just spoke about, you know, mm -hmm. the past 10 years, how a lot of this is now disrupting businesses and impacting mm -hmm. people every single day. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, how are organisations responding to this change? Are we doing yeah. it well? Could we be doing it better? Or what's the actual current situation? Yeah, there's a lots of different things, obviously, that make up an organisation. Mm -hmm. So there's different levers that you can pull. Uh, one example is people and culture. What we're seeing in organisations is... Uh, trying to get people more comfortable with, with that change, as I mm. said, and adopting more agile mindsets. Yep. So where you know, they're ready for change at any moment, they're constantly adapting, constantly shifting directions, mm -hmm. uh, and also adapting, uh, adopting design thinking. So design thinking is a huge uh, phenomenon at the moment within organisations, trying to get people to think more about or what's the experience our employees are going through and our customers and stakeholders and designing changes around mm. those people. So they're really getting uh, real-time feedback from them and they can quickly course correct to continually meet people's changing needs. Um, and as well, as I said, you know, we touched on cultures of organisations. Mm. Large organisations need to continually reinvent and uh, evaluate and change their um, employee value proposition so they continually attract and retain talent. Um, and all these factors, people and culture, they're, they're so powerful within mm. organisations and um, uh, it's often said that culture eats strategy for breakfast, mm. that's how powerful it is. So it doesn't matter what you're trying to do, if the culture doesn't get on board then you won't achieve it. But it is hard to influence and it takes time and it's incremental and leaders play such a big part in it. And this can be quite difficult within, like you know, you mentioned before, startup organisations mm. and they come out with this mindset and they've got this culture, <clears throat> they've got the ping pong table, they've got the right people and they know yes. who they want to hire. But it is what we're talking about today for organisations that are quite mm. set in their ways. Mm. How difficult is that? Like, do you think they really struggle with it or are we getting better at it? They do struggle. Um, I think it takes time, but I, they need to look at the whole organisation as a system. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, you can't just change the culture probably without yeah. changing some systems and processes yeah. um, and the model of how everyone works together. So that's really the key, I think. Mm. When you're going to implement change, you need to think about how it impacts all the other parts of the system. Do you think um, traditionally, and I might be going ahead a little bit here, when it does come to change management, we tend to operate in silos and we don't really think of this, so it's very me, me, me in my department? We can do, yeah. yeah. And uh, in, we have to respect that to an extent because yeah. each department, each team uh, may be impacted in different ways. Mm. You could Im implement a new operating model and it could be 50 teams impacted. Yep. And they could for different reasons, so they need to and to understand, okay, well, how does this affect us? Yep. How does it affect me, my team, what they're going to do each day? And that's what we try and help organisations do, is um, teach those leaders, the middle managers yeah. and the frontline employees how to actually work out what it means for them and what they're going to do differently. Okay, so back to this then. Um, so the operating model efficiency, what's that all about? Um, so an operating model, it refers to lots of different parts of an organisation mm -hmm. and how they work together. It can be the org structure, but it's also how all the different parts connect. Um, and, you know, what was working and what got you to where you are today isn't necessarily what's going to get you to tomorrow. Mm -hmm. When there's changes in perhaps a geographic market where you were getting revenue from, maybe different today than it was yesterday. Yep. 
um, and you may have new, new technology which can enable you to work more efficiently. Mm -hmm. You might be able to outsource things. You know, every Sunday night when I'm, I'm ironing my shirts for the week, I sometimes yeah. think, oh, maybe I should outsource this <laughs> to the dry cleaner and just get that just done. Just once. <laughs> but I think about it, well, what's, what am I, okay, it might save me half an hour of time, but mm -hmm. what am I going to do with that half an hour? Um, is it going to be valuable for me to do that or am I just going to sit there and watch TV and you know, maybe yeah. I should just be ironing my shirts and save the money? Yeah. So you have to constantly evaluate what's best for you right now mm. and if you uh, make that change, how does it impact other, as other aspects of your organisation? I really find technology interesting here because I think yeah. you're going to talk a bit about that but I find um, you know speaking to people and even own experiences a lot of people think that technology is going to make their life a lot easier but sometimes it's not always mm. the case is it? No <laughs> um, and it can be for various reasons yeah. you know a lot of the time you know within organisations that I'm working with um, I've helped many organisations implement new technology into mm. their organisation and usually there's a collective sigh yeah. when you say we're impl implementing a new system uh, but I think there's two different things, two different ways to see change. One mm. is that it's a process yep. and the other is that it's an outcome. Mm. And often we don't like the change process, for example. If I said to you, hey, Sarah, tomorrow you're going to have to move house, you yeah. might scratch your head and go, what? Do I, do yeah. I have to do that? I have to go and look for a house? But if I f tell you and focus you on the fact that it's going to be a bigger house or it's got that extra mm. bedroom, maybe a water view, and then you finally get into that house, you're going to be pretty happy there if it's exactly what you wanted and it's going to be better for you. And I think that, you know, just as you said that, that really resonated with me, the whole yeah. concept of, you know, a lot of people would change happens. They're so reluctant to change. Yeah. But we tend to justify it or, mm. you know, describe why it would be better or we don't actually tell them about the outcome. We sort of just almost yes. argue about the process and why they should be doing it, don't we? Yeah, it's kind of just uh, hitting your head against the brick yeah. wall. And so I think that's why what our leaders need to focus on is really what's the benefit of that technology or the mm. change? How are, how are my people impacted? And what's, have that really good vision for the mm. future. If you can focus everyone on the long game, you know, yep. where we'll be at in the future, not just the sort of tough process. Yeah. You know, because um, you know, running a marathon is really hard. It's going to be painful and exhausting, but people still do it because they want the satisfaction of completing it and, Afterwards. and you know, the better fitness or whatever the results from it. So there's sort of four of the key elements, and mm -hmm. I think what many organisations are doing at the moment, how they're responding, is, is uh, impacting all of those. They've got projects mm. and changes in the pipeline which impact all, uh, and that is a good way to make sure the whole system is aligned. So uh, managing it as an enterprise transformation, and that's particularly the case for uh, significantly disrupted industries. Uh, mm. The media sector, for one, is a big example which comes to mind. They're really in a fight for survival mm -hmm. with you know, Netflixes and the free content uh, print, uh, competing with print yep. media and so forth. Um, but also even you know, banks have an ongoing transformation, even mm. though you might think they're in a quite comfortable position. Uh, there's a constant threat of fintechs, yeah. new startups coming. Uh, customers are still, you know, pretty unhappy with banks, don't necessarily see them in a positive way. So mm. they have an ongoing transformation as well, really just to ready themselves for the future. Yeah. And if anyone does have any questions about um, the specific situation that you're in at the moment, um, or maybe some comments about change that your organisation has recently gone through, please type it in the chat box. Um, I've got the iPad right next to me, so I'll see any questions come up, and then we can really pick Hugh's brain, um, especially as we go to the next bit. So, um, you know, this is all about leadership when it does come down to it, mm. and, you know, being that leader that does stand out from the rest through our change management processes. Do you think that we're doing a good job of guiding people through these because I think sometimes, you know, there is a big pat on the back when something works out right. Mm. But, you know, some change management process could result in something amazing and mm. then all your team leaves. Yes, <laughs> I think, yeah, we've all seen that, I think. And as you said, you know, 70% or so of mm. change efforts do fail to realise their intended outcomes. Mm. That might be because the solution that was chosen or the particular change was the wrong thing for that organisation at the mm. moment. So it's a strategy issue. Um, or it could be that the change was implemented poorly. And I'd say uh, the consensus is often that the change is implemented poorly. Yeah. So leaders aren't necessarily doing a good job all of the time. Yeah. And what we've seen, as you can see here, is uh, a change or an evolution of how change is delivered or change is actually changing. Um, traditionally, the old school way is the size 11 approach, yep. which is the kind of military style leader 
who uh, makes a change and if their people don't do it, they're just going to kick them in the butt. I bet you love walking into organisations and being confronted with those guys. <laughs> they still exist. Um, they definitely still exist. Yeah. And maybe sometimes that's you need to resort to that at a certain time. Yeah. Maybe if you've got a recalcitrant employee and you need to sort of, you know, really make that change happen. Yeah. But employees really, uh, as we said, they have a bit more power these days. Um, and often they know more about what's going on, the best thing for the organisation than mm. the leader does. Sometimes the leaders are sitting in, you know, the ivory tower, um, calling the shots, but uh, they aren't seeing the customer issues up yeah. front. They aren't seeing the frontline employees' experience. So leaders, uh, more effective leaders, will listen to employees mm. to find out how they're impacted and is this the right strategy for them, as well as the process for how to deliver it. So listening to how the, um, it should be done. Um, moreover, I think what we've seen in the last few decades is the rise of change management as a discipline. So mm. a structured management of the change. Um, and that's why people like me have jobs in specialising yeah. in change management yeah. and consultants that have those jobs. Uh, largely came about and congruent with you know, software development, more technology going to organisations. Mm. The techies and the leaders putting that in realise they can't just build a solution and hope people will figure it out because yeah, they're not yeah. all technical. Um, and so... Uh, but there needed to be a structure there to help people understand how to use those new systems, new processes, new ways of working. So um, change management was born as a discipline. Yep. But what we're seeing really right now and, and why we have this concept of the change intelligent leader and what Blue Seed really tries to do as an organisation, we help our clients become change intelligent organisations. So collaborative change um, is really the priority at the moment and making change part of business as usual. So. Um, not just having a project mm. team or a, you know, a bunch of technology people throwing a solution into the business and hoping for the best, mm. but making everyone in the business working really well together so that they implement it really, really well. And this is um, CQ, and I think this is yeah. awesome because as soon as you put a Q in front of something, I'm sold. <laughs> I'm like, I need to know this. Um, so this is really what you were talking about before, like the entire organisation mm. and everyone being involved within this process, isn't That's it? That's right. Yeah, I mean, leaders have a, a key role to play simply because uh, they touch on so many different people yeah. within the organisation, different parts of the organisation. You know, when the CEO speaks, usually there could be you know, thousands, tens of thousands of people mm. listening. So what the CEO does is going to play a big impact. Same with all the leaders in the org organisation. Yeah. But everyone... Uh, can play a role as well, even if you're not in a formal leadership position. Mm. So we believe everyone needs to have change intelligence, this, this CQ concept. So mm. we've got it, obviously your um, intelligence quotient, your yeah. emotional intelligence quotient, and now we say that change intelligence is really one of the key leadership imperatives and the imperative to survive in this VUCA world and not not freak out. Yeah, and I get that, that probably plays in various aspects of someone's life, right? Not just within the workplace, but it probably carries over into how they operate on so many levels. Yeah, yeah. I think so. So it's a blend of art and science, mm. we always say. Um, and, you know, being emotionally intelligent is part of it. So being, I guess, level-headed, no yeah. matter what the, the craziness that's mm. going on around you. Um, but also having, I, I guess, a structured way to thinking about change. So yeah. Um, having key tools and techniques for how you influence change in other people, how you bring others on the journey with mm. you and how you take yourself along that change journey. I think it's um, a blend of lots of different things, which is why we have this chart with lots of different words yeah. referring to what change intelligence is. It's just actually clicked to me. It's a CQ. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. After all this time, it worked. Um, so we now understand that it's important and, you know, um, mm. as organisations, you know, go into this next, you know, um, area of the unknown, like yep. you said, that it's important to be this change intelligent leader. Mm. How do we know if we have the capabilities or the potential to be this? And is there a yeah. point where we're like, do you know what? We can't be that person. We are mm. that size 11 guy. What mm. do we do then? Yeah, it's a, that's a good, really good question. Mm. I think um, one of the most important things is that uh, you know, the different roles within the organisation are working together. Yep. So if you're struggling, there should be lots of people that you can reach out to, mm. whether it's your leader, whether it's a different part of the business, um, or if you see a problem with the change and you think it's not going to work for yep. you, that you do something about it. I think too often organisations and people within organisations will just accept, oh, yeah, this change is just going to fail and yeah. I'm just going to let it fail and yeah, just like that I'll other one. Yeah, I'll just watch you. <laughs> yeah, so I think there's, there's more that can be done than just yeah. that acceptance. Um, you shouldn't accept that things are just the norm, that that's the way it is. Mm. You know, an organize, some organisations I, I go into, you know, I talk to 
one of the leaders or a middle manager and they say, oh, that person doesn't, never talks to that department and mm. that never happens. And I sort of say, well, why? Yeah. And they, it's often not a very good answer. It could be just like, oh, that's just the way it's always been. And, mm. um, not acceptable. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, for me, the job's easier. The fix is there. Yeah, I yeah. say, well, okay, we just need a, a team to actually talk to each other. You mm. need a process to do that, whether it's a cross-functional team. So the solutions are actually easier than you often expect. Um, and it's just a matter of looking for help for the right people. Okay, so here are the capabilities here. So can we go through these just quite high level? Yeah. Um, once again, just to tell people online exactly what it all means, how yeah. they can become this person and whether or not they do have the capability to do yeah, so. Yeah, sure. So I guess we've touched on some of this stuff. The change intelligent leader, um, you know, these are just some examples of the capabilities that they might have. Um, and there's, there's lots and lots of different mm. um, capabilities. And we teach uh, businesses and leaders a lot of those in the training that yeah. we do. Um, but they understand the case for change and they mm. track, um, track and measure change. So yeah. they know what a change is trying to uh, achieve. They might hear about it from the CEO or the boss, but um, they might not understand it immediately, but they go and find out. Mm. So they want to know, is this going to save my people time? Is it going to benefit? How is it going to benefit our customers? And they want to connect all the dots back to that benefit. Yeah. So that when they actually make the change in the organisation, they can go and track it. They can see, okay, well, is this new technology really saving my people time? Mm. If it's not, why not? What do, we, do we need to do something different or do we need to get this solution fixed? Mm. So they're inquisitive and they're tracking success to make sure that it actually is sticking within their organisation. Um, they also understand the change drivers and they com and craft a compelling narrative. As mm. I touched on, uh, you know, they know what's going on in the organisation environment. And what I always say to people is that, you know, change isn't driven by organisations. Organisations really just adapt to change. Mm -hmm. um, so when people sort of say, oh, the boss is changing things again and blaming the boss and why are they yeah, doing yeah, yeah. this? Really, the boss is just um, making the best of what's going on in the larger environment. We're, we're in a state at the moment globally where, you know, a 19-year-old um, Harvard University dropout programming in his dorm room um, can actually do something which, you know, a few years later is mm. going to be impacting billions of people on the organisation and changing the way we live our lives and changing the way we connect. So that's how, um, you know, compelling the, the environment is at the moment. Do you, I'll ask you something a little bit off topic then, do you feel like, you know, going back even to university or high school, we all, you know, change management, internal, external influences, mm -hmm. do you think disruption is just the new word for change? Um, I think disruption is... Oh, yeah, we're focusing too much on it. <laughs> well, disruption is yeah. definitely a term which is used a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, people say, I'm going to disrupt this, I'm yeah, going to disrupt yeah. that, I'm going to disrupt this room it? as they walk into it. You know, it could mean anything. Yeah. But I think it's really, um, it, it's just a, a catalyst for change, effectively. Mm. Change, as I said, you know, it's a process, it's an outcome. Yeah. It's an adaptive process as well as a driving force. Yeah. Um, and disruption is kind of really a trigger for that. Yep. I think it's really a trigger for the change process and, and what, what you do in response. Okay. Um, so as a leader, if you want to be this person, here yeah. are the capabilities. Yes. As an organisation, um, so communicates top down, bottom up. You mm. know, is that something, are these things set in stone or do you only have to have one or two of them? Um, yeah, some may be more important for yeah. orga an organisation than others. There's no prescriptive response. Yeah. I'd have to go and have a look at the organisation. You have to go and consult. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I do ask questions before just you know, drumming this home. But, um, yeah, it, it, it varies. But I think as an organisation, it's hard to just create a change-intelligent organisation yeah. without in creating change-intelligent leaders. Yep. You need to start at the top, but you also need to look after the people in the middle. And often mm. they're uh, the forgotten people, the, the team leaders, the managers of people on the ground, as well as the, pe the frontline employees. So mm. we need to listen to them and give them the skills and knowledge to actually be good at change and to actually make it stick because an uh, leaders can actually make a change happen. Yep. But it's really the frontline people, the team managers who are going to decide whether it actually sticks in the long term or they just go back to their old ways and start doing it the old way yeah. or finding a workaround or putting dodgy data in the system or whatever. So um, it's about just involving them in the process um, and trying to give them the skills as much as possible. So I think a lot of these things, the capabilities of change intelligent mm -hmm. organisation are how you know that uh, your change intelligent leadership is doing a good job yeah. um, and encouraging... Uh, those people in all levels of the organisation to play a role in it. So change is everyone's job. 
Okay, we've got a question from Alan on this sure. slide, so we'll get right. to this now. What happens if you don't have a change, intelli in cha change intelligent leaders within change intelligent organisations or vice versa? So that's quite interesting mm. because you've got these two in an ideal world within the yes. change can I just call it CQ organization? Yep. <laughs> You've got a CQ leader. Yes. But what if they're not fitting? And what if, you know, is that where more change has to happen? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm sure there's lots of organizations that have that problem. Um, yep. I think even top organizations, there's a mixture of mixture mm. of change intelligence in terms of their leaders. Um, and we may not always, even the most change intelligent people may not always be change intelligent mm. at the time. So it's a conscious thing. Um, but what I would say is that it's not just formal leaders within organisations which have the power to drive change yeah. and be change intelligent and create change intelligent organisations. Anyone can do it mm -hmm. and it's just a matter of, you know, being proactive about it. Uh, for example, you know, that example I said about, mm. you know, if, if the change isn't working, do something about it. Yeah. You know, raise issues, question things. So if you don't understand why a change is happening, um, you know, ask a question so that you do understand. Say, hey, we need to know why this is happening. We need yeah. to know how we're going to benefit so that we make sure we make the most of this and we do benefit. So don't be afraid to question leaders respectfully mm. um, and, you know, encourage the... And it, Oh, an influence of your peers as well yeah. across teams. Yeah, and like teams. you said earlier, you know, there's people on the front line that mm. might be more um, in the front line and speaking to yeah. customers all the time and understanding what's actually happening out there. So yeah. how, what are you, what's your tips on bringing those people in um, to the people? This probably goes into the next thing I was going to yes. ask you in terms of who does lead the change within an organisation yes. and how do you blend the two? Yeah, so there are different key roles within an organisation which influence change and it includes everyone. Mm. Um, as we said, change is everyone's job. Traditionally, you know, change is sparked or I guess by the leaders in an organisation. Yep. So it could be the CEO or someone at that top level or a general manager who owns a budget mm -hmm. to fund a change initiative. Um, we call them change architects at Blue yep. Seed. So they're the ones who have a vision for how the organisation should function mm -hmm. in the future. They usually cough up the money to make it happen so they yep. have a solid stake in its success. Um, and they might sit on steering committees and try and make mm -hmm. sure things are being done correctly as it's being implemented. Um, you also have change enablers who are you know, change managers or project managers, mm -hmm. people who work in project teams, consultants like myself who come in and try and build and deploy the change within the organisation. Um, and obviously they're a quite a mature practice in many industries. Uh, then you also have what we call change makers and we think they're one of the most important roles in an organisation and that's really the business itself. Mm. So everyone from senior executives down to middle managers to the frontline employees. Uh, so what this uh, CQ organisational system is implying is that all three of those roles need to really work together mm. on any change initiative. So. Um, if you're implementing a change as a change manager, you need to go and consult the business mm. and maybe it's a sales organisation, you need to go and speak to some salespeople and say, hey, yeah. will this technology work for you? How will it work? How will your role be impacted? What will you need to do differently? Mm. What will that team over there need to do differently? What are your customers going to think of this? Asking a lot of those questions and doing a real impact assessment mm. um, and listening really, really carefully to them. So what happens in a non change intelligent organisation yeah. um, is, you know, the change enables and the architects will you know, fund the change, build it and then kind of throw it over the fence to the business and yeah, they're yeah. sort of scrambling trying to go, why is this happening? Why did we do this? You know, yeah. we didn't want this. Um, so to avoid that, it's really all three aspects or all three elements of the organisation working together mm. to make sure it's designed right. And I think that's really a lot of what, um, you know, design thinking is. A lot of organisations are using design thinking. So thinking about um, what's the customer experience? Yep. What is it today? What do we need it to be? Um, and you know, thinking about what their needs are, what are their preferences, what's the real problem we're trying to solve for them? But also thinking of that in terms of employees. Yeah. So what's their experience today? What do we want them to care about? Or what do they care about? But we have to go and ask them to find that out, to mm. design the solution and the change process effectively. Okay, definitely makes sense. Um, we do have a few questions coming in now. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to please ask people to complete the feedback survey, which you'll find in the tab on the top of the screen. Please complete that and we'll send you the recording because you'll no doubt want to share this with um, some other members in your team, maybe some change intelligent leaders or people who need to be or change intelligent. Or less intelligent. intelligent. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just don't tell them which one they are. Um, and then also there's some links here on the screen as well that Hugh has very kindly put together. Um, so this is more about 
about Blue Seed, where they can find more information, or perhaps you yourself want to find out how he can help your organisation. So there's details on there. I'll send his details afterwards. Complete the survey, you get the recording. Simple. Um, what I'm going to now is go through some questions. Um, so first of all, and this is just going back to that slide, which I'll take us back to, um, which actually talks to those three people within the organisation. Yes. Um, okay, so this is from Sophia. Within our organisation, we put teams together for certain projects. Is this similar to what you're talking about? Yes. So yeah. I guess the team that's put together for a project would fit into the change enabler. Yeah. Um, component there and your change architects you know it could be your sponsor the person providing funding or someone from that part mm. of the business might work with you on a working group or a steering committee yeah um, so what we're also saying is yep that's great have your project team they're important to either mm. build a software or system or design a new operating yep. model whatever the case may be that they're delivering um, but involve the, the business leaders so yeah. Uh, whether it be a regional manager of a sales team or a state manager or, um, you know, a, whatever the impacted workforce is, mm. involve key people who really understand the customer, understand the people who are infected, um, and involve them in the design of the solution, yep. involve them in how the change is implemented. So usually change managers will come up with a, a plan to implement how they're going to communicate the change, how they're going to train people, mm. how they're going to engage people. But you want to, before you do that, you want to ask your business leaders, your change makers, um, what's going to be the best process for you to make sure we get the right outcome. Yeah, I hope that answers your question, Sophia. I think a lot of the time, you're right, mm. we just create teams and we think, you know, oh, we're helping the business grow, we're helping yes. this change happen, but we're just one piece of the puzzle. That's and right. where are the other two? How are they That's involved? exactly the key yeah. takeaway. So yeah. you build a project team, absolutely yeah. important, but it's not going to make success on its own. It's okay. really about the business and involving people. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have another question here. Sure. So this one's from Nathan. Um, so within our organisation, I do think we manage change quite effectively. However, a lot of it isn't done within a certain time period. Do you have any recommendations? That's a great, great <laughs> question. And again, it's case by case. Uh, I think you have to ask the question on each case why it's not being done mm. within a certain time period. Yeah. Is it, uh, you know, is it poorly forecasted? How, do we not have good plans? Are we not consulting yeah. the right people in developing those plans to make sure that they're well thought out and achievable? Mm -hmm. I think all objectives have to be smart, so specific, measurable, yep. achievable, uh, realistic, and um, time, time. time have mm -hmm. a time attached to them. Uh, so sometimes I think organisations can be very ambitious. Mm. Uh, my experience is they underestimate sometimes how long it takes to adopt a change. So yep. they might. Uh, underestimate the time to actually implement. So mm. sometimes we build the solution on time, you have a good project manager who's really good at that, but people won't adopt it immediately and it takes them more time because it's really mm. complicated. They need to take time to learn it, they need to take time to practice with a new system or practice in the new process, um, and then they may, might need more support after they've had a go at it. So. Mm. Uh, I think there's no simple answer to the yeah. question. but It's more of an internal thing that might need to be... Yeah, yeah. but I think one, one statistic I've seen recently is, uh, um, I hope I don't misquote it, but I think it was projects that have effective change management are six times more likely to finish on time to budget mm. and within the scope. Agreed. So I think change does have a big impact on yeah. time and, and schedule. So if it is done well, most people are happy, plans are really well thought out, and it should go according to plan. Yeah, and I think they probably feel like they've got the support of other people within the organisation then, don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and final question from Monique. So if you do have any questions, please get them through now. Um, our our organisation is quite reluctant to change. What are your tips? Do you think that... Sorry. Do you think that we should actually survey people without, within our organisation about what we need to change or do we leave it to top managers? That's a good question as well. They're all really good questions. <laughs> I think I, I like the idea of a survey. Maybe mm. uh, how you go about it um, would be the key. Mm. I think, think the reason I like s surveys, um, they may not always be the right way to go about it, but at least it's asking for input. Yeah. Um, and, it's, and it's putting onus on people to say, hey, um, you want a better organisation mm. or we want to do this for you. So you, the change makers out there, um, we care about what you think and we're mm. going to design something which is going to impact it. The, where sometimes organisations fall down is that they fail to actually deliver on what the employees are telling them. Yeah. So everyone's done a survey or an engagement survey, 
you know, they talk about the things they don't like and like and then nothing happens. Oh, is that the worst? And it's the like, thanks for your feedback, no one cares. Yeah, so... Um, <laughs> So that's, that's my feedback on the survey. I think it's good to ask questions and involve people, but I would maybe um, try and establish more, um, give them more of a formal role. Mm. Key people, whether it's the most change averse people, sometimes mm. involving them very, very closely uh, in an effort to change the organisation is a good thing because you can turn them around. If yeah. you can turn around the most change averse person into a change supporter, then that's going to be a powerful force for all mm. their people because everyone will see, well, even that person's buying into it. Yeah, Maybe I'll I should too, yeah, because yeah. normally they hate everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's one technique as well. Okay. Well, that does bring us to the end. So thank you very much. I've got your details up on screen now. Um, like I said, we will send through the recording within 48 hours. Final thoughts from you. It's been great having you on. Mm. I think you've touched so many different aspects and mm. the thing I like about it is there's stuff in there that we can take away and apply or influence within our organisation yes. today, which is always great. a great 40 minutes well spent Fantastic. in my book. Um, final thoughts. What's your top tip for people out there? Well, I think at Blue Seed, you know, our mission is really to make the entire world more change capable. Mm. We want others to join us in this mission. So I think the key takeaway for people, I hope today, is that you can be more capable of change. You yeah. can thrive during change, even with the VUCA world, the volatile yeah. uncertainty, all that stuff, which sounds scary. Um, the future can be very, very bright. And yeah. I think we have to stay focused on that, but also um, build our ability to manage change and try and help other people through that as well and influence other people so they become more change intelligent. Great. Wouldn't that be an ideal world? <laughs> be <Great>. like Avatar. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for joining, and we hope to see you at future Business Skills events. Have a great day. Thank you.